Okay, welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. If I'm not a familiar face to you, my name is Ronit Holtzman and I'm the Vice President, Senior Vice President of Philanthropy and Plan Giving and Endowments for the Jewish Foundation and UJ Federation. Um, we're delighted to provide you with this Now You Know speaker series co-hosted by the Jewish Foundation and UJA. As, part, as one of the largest community organizations in Canada, the Jewish Foundation helps families and individuals um, translate their philanthropic dreams into reality. Our goal is to make charitable giving easy and rewarding now and as part of your estate plan so that our community can remain strong today and in the future. Many of you are aware of the serious needs in our community that are far greater than ever before due to the impact of COVID-19. We have seen a 400% increase in a need for interest-free loans, an 85% increase in community members requesting addiction or dependency counseling, and 30% increase from Holocaust survivors requesting help, just to name a few of the many needs out there. UJA is focused on ensuring our community comes out of this pandemic as a whole, as much of a whole as possible, but we can't do it without donors like you. Every single dollar has the opportunity to save a life. If you are in a position to make a gift today, no matter how small or how big, you will be a crucial part in ensuring our community's future. To make a donation to UJA, please visit jewishtoronto.com. We've also provided a link in the chat window of the webinar. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize and thank our presenting sponsor, KRG Insurance Brokers, our webinar sponsor, KSB, and our professional division signature sponsor, Scotiabank. We really appreciate the willingness of our sponsors to stick with us during these unprecedented times. I would like to note that this session is being recorded and will be emailed to all of you later today and be available on our website, jewishtoronto.com. Luckily for me, I've had the privilege of working with many estate planning professionals through the Jewish Foundation, and both Marnie and Brittany are terrific, creative, dedicated and thoughtful. They're gonna present in a minute, I'm gonna introduce themselves. Ask questions, feel free to use the chat button at the bottom of the webinar. They will try to address all of your questions, mostly general. Please try not to be super specific as they won't have answers to your specific questions. And now, Marnie Pernica, a partner at Aird and Burles LLP, and a member of the firm's tax group, estates and trust group, and estates and succession planning group, and Brittany said, an associate of Miller Thompson LLP, a member of their private client services group, and their social impact group. Welcome, and thank you both of us for volunteering today and giving up your time. Marnie? Hi, thank you for that kind introduction, and welcome, everyone. I'm still getting used to the Zoom webinar, so if I'm not giving proper eye contact, I apologize. <laughs> Um, just bear with me. So I just wanted to start, I just wanted to give you kind of a high level of what Brittany and I uh, propose to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of having wills, um, why you should have them, powers of attorneys, um, and proper the importance of having proper estate planning documents in place. Um, we're going to go on to talk about how to witness wills in this world of social distancing and how to still get them done. Uh, we're going to shift a bit to talk about when to update them because I'm sure many of you already have them in place. So just some thoughts on when to update them again, particularly given the world we're living in. We're going to get into a bit of a conversation on how to plan um, some tools that we see people using both properly and improperly um, in terms of some probate planning. Um, and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Brittany will move to some charitable giving and, and how to shift your charitable focus during a pandemic. Um, I, as I believe Ronit said, we'll take questions, um, take the, send them in as you kind of have them, but we're likely to just answer them at the end. We're going to leave some time for questions. So please feel free to send them um, and we will do our best to answer them. And with that, I'm going to, I'm just going to give you a very high level of some commonly used estate planning tools. And we're gonna, again, talk about these, but generally people think about wills, that's the first thing. And a lot of you may already have primary secondary wills. They're called uh, primary secondary wills, public private wills, corporate wills. There's lots of different ways of slicing it, but generally speaking, it's when instead of having one will, you have two, and we do that for probate planning, and that we're gonna talk about on the back end of this presentation. 
powers of attorneys for property. So those are the documents that work while you're alive but incapable. I'm dealing with your finances and healthcare, the person who's gonna uh, deal with your healthcare decisions when you can't. Um, again, I wanted to highlight the fact that trusts are a big part of estate planning. Um, the use of alter ego dress, joint partner trusts, and kind of the typical family trust. Trusts are outside of the scope of this presentation, but we wouldn't have done our job if we didn't at least acknowledge their existence. So, um, Brittany, I'm gonna move to, you're gonna, you're gonna take over. <laughs> Thank you, Marnie, and thank you everyone for tuning in this morning and to, the, uh, to UJA and the Jewish Foundation for having us speak with you this morning. Um, so why is it important to have a will? A well-drawn will is the most essential element of an estate plan. A will is flexible. For the most part, you can decide who is to inherit your assets, at what age, and under what circumstances. Without a will, statute law will determine who will receive your assets and when. The legislative scheme is arbitrary, it's inflexible, it doesn't take into account each particular individual's needs. It may also result in the increased payment of income taxes and administrative fees. A will is also re revocable, so it can be changed at any time up until the date of death as long as you have the required mental capacity. A will is also ambulatory, which means that it speaks from the date of death. So it encompasses all of your assets that you acquire after the date that you sign your will up until the date of death. Having a will makes it easier for your loved ones after you're gone. It conveys your wishes and intentions to them and reduces administrative hassles and expenses. If you make a will, you also might be able to take advantage of potential tax savings, such as probate tax and income tax savings. Marnie's gonna speak about probate tax a bit later on in the presentation, but on the income tax side, in Canada, when a person dies, they're deemed to have disposed of all of their capital property. So things like real estate, investments, there's an artificial sale event. So there's no real sale of these assets, but you're deemed to have disposed of them for tax purposes at the time of death. And if the assets have gone up in value since you've acquired them, then you'll have what is called a capital gain, 50% of which is taxable. Now there's ways to minimize this capital gains tax if you engage in estate planning, such as estate freezes and insurance opportunities. We're not gonna be speaking um, about those strategies during this presentation, but you're always welcome after this webinar to speak to either one of us or your own advisor to learn how you can minimize income taxes on death. Wills can also be used to maintain some control over assets after you're gone. So for example, you can set up a trust in your will to prevent your beneficiaries from prematurely spending their inheritance, or to provide for minor beneficiaries, those who are under 18, or for disabled beneficiaries who might be receiving government benefits that you wanna make sure are uh, maintained. Wills also allow you to appoint a person or people that you trust most to manage your estate after you're gone, and this is known as your executor or your estate trustee. Having a will plan in place may also minimize the potential for litigation. A will also allows you to provide for gifts or to, to people or to charities who may otherwise not benefit from your estate. So now we're gonna look at uh, what would happen if you were to die without a will. And dying without a will is known as dying intestate. In Ontario, we have legislation, the Succession Law Reform Act, which provides for a particular scheme of distribution if you were to pass away without a will. Now this chart outlines um, each specific circumstance who would receive the assets of your estate. So if you're married and have no children, your spouse would receive all of your property. If you're married with children, and have less than $200,000 of assets, again, your spouse would receive all of your property. If you're married and have one child and have more than $200,000 of assets, 
the spouse would receive what is called a preferential share and that amount is two hundred thousand dollars and the remainder is then divided equally half to your spouse and half to your child if you're married and have two or more children and have greater than two hundred thousand dollars of assets again your spouse would receive that preferential share of two hundred thousand dollars and the remainder is divided one third to your spouse and two thirds equally among however many children you have. If you have no spouse, but you have children, everything is just divided equally among your children. And when I mention children here, if you have a child that has predeceased you, but they leave their own children or grandchildren, so they leave their own lineal descendants, then the share that your child would have received of your estate would be divided among their lineal descendants. So it could be your grandchildren, for example. Uh, if you're single, have no children, all of your property is divided equally between your parents. And if there's only one parent surviving, then everything is, is going to that surviving parent. Um, if you have no parents, then everything would be left to your siblings. And again, if a sibling has predeceased you, but they have left their own children, then the share that your sibling would have received would be going to um, their children equally. If there's no siblings, next would be nieces and nephews. If you have no nieces and nephews, then um, next would be your next of kin. And then the last resort, if there's no next of kin, is the government. So this is contrary to what some people think that, you know, if you don't have a will, the government gets all of your assets. That's not um, exactly the case. There is a scheme that um, is followed. So any relatives really would receive your assets before the government. And now this is all subject to assets that pass outside of your estate. For example, if you own property jointly with right of survivorship with another person, then the property will go to the surviving joint owner on your death. And Marnie's gonna talk about joint ownership a bit later on in the presentation. Some other things I just wanna note is when I speak about married here, I'm talking about legally married spouses, not common law partners. So if you've been with your partner for 20 or 30 years and you were never legally married, if you don't have a will, the common law partner is not entitled to any share of your estate if you pass away under these uh, under these rules also when i talk about children stepchildren are not included here but adopted children are considered your children and um, children born outside of marriage are also included as well without a will um, any interests of minors so if you have a child that's under 18 or a grandchild that's under 18 any interest of the minors sorry, would be um have to pay have to be paid into court and because the minor cannot hold assets legally in their own name and their share would be managed on behalf of a government representative until they turn 18, at which time their entire inheritance would be paid to them. And a lot of people think that 18 is too young for a child to inherit a potentially significant sum of money. So that's why it's important to, to create a will. You can set up a trust in your will for your minor children um, and delay the, the age that, they'll, that they will receive an inheritance from you. You can delay the age to later age such as 21 or 25 or 30 or 35 or whatever, whatever it is that you decide. Without a will, you also can't appoint a guardian for minor children. Um, and that's something that you can do in your will. And this is a temporary appointment. It's a 90 day appointment. If you appoint a guardian, um, if you were to pass away and you have children under 18, and this is valid for 90 days, within which time uh, that person would have to apply to court to become named the permanent guardian. Without a will, as I said before, you also can't you know, engage in any tax planning. You can't minimize income or probate taxes. You can't plan for disabled beneficiaries. It just creates a lot of hassle, um, expense, and potential delay in the administration of your estate. Now I'm going to pass it back to Marnie and she's going to talk about powers of attorney. Thanks, Brittany. I always find it interesting to listen about 
the consequences of not having a will. Um, so turning now to powers of attorney. So these documents, interestingly, often come at the tail end of a conversation with an estate planner. But in this world in particular, some of the most important documents you may have. So, so there's two kinds of powers of attorneys, and one is for property. And, and that's really the document that gives someone the, the legal authority to act on your behalf with respect to your finances. Um, so that's the first leg. The second leg is healthcare. And healthcare is, again, I alluded to this earlier in the presentation, but the person who's going to make your healthcare decisions when you can no longer do that. One, one key thing that I find clients often get a bit confused about is the language. It's called a continuing power of attorney for property and a power of attorney for personal care. The person whom you name does not have to be an attorney or a lawyer. It's just a term that's used. So oftentimes when I use that term, clients are like, well, do I have to name my lawyer to make my healthcare decisions? I'm not, that's not something I'd like to do. So just wanted to clarify that it's just the term that's used in the legislation. So a power of attorney for property specifically, um, currently the, the general kind of standard is to create a continuing power of attorney. And the critical part of that is that that's actually a document that is valid as of the moment it's signed. So when you go into your lawyer's office and you sign the documents, as of that moment, in theory, your attorney could go and, and use the documents to take over your finances. Um, with that said, I don't know about um, Brittany's practice, but here we keep those. We keep those original documents because um, generally speaking, a bank or anyone um, isn't going to rely on a copy. So the originals kind of stay with us in safekeeping and that often gives clients some assurance that they're not gonna be dealt with um, inappropriately. I will also comment that there, you can have more than one. So we do a lot of planning for clients who have family businesses and also have a family of their own and there's kind of two pools of wealth. So something that we often do is we create two powers of attorneys for property and we'll give one, you know, we'll do the corporate power of attorney and we'll do the general power of attorney. And oftentimes you name different people in those. Um, uh, you know, the thought is the family that's involved in the family business will deal with the corporate assets and a spouse is, can deal with the personal assets. But that's just something that we do and it's important to highlight that there can be more than one. You can also have powers of attorneys for very specific things like a closing, a transaction, certain assets um, and a certain purpose. And generally we don't, I don't use triggering event. I find it very difficult to use that a power of attorney for property only becomes um, valid on incapacity. Incapacity, it's beyond the scope of this conversation, but it's fluid. Um, it's hard to get a doctor's note. So I generally don't do triggering, triggering powers of attorneys. Um, the, the, the beautiful thing about a power of attorney for property is that you're able to think about it and give it thought and decide who you want to appoint. Um, there's consequences of not having one, as there is with any document that you don't have. Um, so there is a default. If you don't have a power of attorney for property, um, there will, you know, the, the, a government agency, the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee can step in to help manage. Um, but again, you don't want the government involved. So the consequence of not having one really is the loss of choice, the loss of the ability for someone to step in, either when you're incapable or even at a moment in time where you can't get to the bank. In a, in a COVID world, people are bound to their homes right now and people are using the powers of attorneys for property for pure convenience purposes in order to get things done while, while we're navigating this pandemic. Um, a lot of it is about, and, and I'll circle back, to the loss of opportunity, the loss of opportunity to pick someone, the loss of opportunity to think about how you would want your assets managed if you couldn't. Um, some of the clauses that we put in talk about residency. I wanna stay in my home. I want you to outfit my home in any way you can in order to keep me there. And you lose the choice of, of giving these direct instructions to your attorney when you don't have one. And there's also the general delay. Without the documents, no one knows who's appointed. The banks have no one to take authority from. Real estate transactions can be delayed. So again, there's a loss. There's a loss of opportunity. There's a loss of choice. And there's the inevitable delay and increased fees and costs to get everything done. Um, turning to the power of attorney for personal care, um, again, 
the, 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 one of the key, well, aside from the fact that this is healthcare and not finances, another key distinction in this document is that this one is only good once you've lost capacity. Britt, can you just push the slide forward? Thanks. Um, so this, this document only comes into place when you've lost capacity. An attorney for, for healthcare cannot go to your doctor and start making your healthcare decisions when you're perfectly capable of making them. Um, and for that reason, I, I strongly urge clients to talk to the person who they're appointing, um, to have a conversation about their intentions, what they would like to see happen, how they would like their healthcare decisions to be made, and to ensure that that person wants to act um, and is agreeing to act. Um, that document often, as a default, if a client wants it, will include kind of the end of life or no heroic measure clause. And, and this is a clause that in this world is becoming um, more and more important and something that clients are really turning their minds to. Do they have it? Do they not have it? And for more importantly, what does it say? And as a general statement, this is kind of the clause that speaks to the paddles and it speaks to medication, it speaks to a level of comfort. It doesn't go through step-by-step step the type of treatments. Um, lawyers are not medical professionals. We have no business drafting those kinds of documents, nor are they legally valid. So um, it's really a guide. So one thing that clients are really turning, I find, are really turning their mind to is the ventilator question and whether they want to be put on a ventilator or not. Um, and it's very personal and there's a lot of things out there. And the clause that you have, more likely than not, in your um, power of attorney for personal care document doesn't include that. So sitting back and having the conversations, and I don't necessarily think that you need to include it in the document itself, but having the conversation with the person who's supposed to make this decision is important. Thinking about whether or not they're gonna follow your instructions based on their own values and their belief set is another important one. Um, and the last thing that I'll comment on is if you do have a document and you've changed your mind on your healthcare directive, um, you can express that in writing to someone else and it's your later wish that's gonna prevail. Um, very quickly, a lot of clients are asking about um, MAID and powers of attorneys for personal care. And I've, I'm not gonna go through the qualifications for MAID. I'm not, again, I'm not a healthcare practitioner, but what I will emphasize is that your attorneys for personal care, your attorney cannot make that decision for you. MAID is not available once you've lost capacity. There is an express requirement that you be able to consent at the moment it happens. So at this point in time, the law does not allow for those kinds of instructions to be incorporated in your documents. Um, and I will, leave it, I will leave it at that. Again, the consequence of not having a power of attorney for personal care, I will circle back to choice. I will circle back to opportunity to have a discussion and to give your thoughts on how you want your life and your healthcare decisions to be made. Um, there is a default um, under the Healthcare Consent Act of who would act if you don't have a power of attorney um, for property, for personal care. But again, generally that's not, that's not where you wanna go and that's not where you wanna land on it. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go, Brittany's gonna, Brittany's gonna jump in again. Thanks, Marnie. Yeah, so now we've kind of given you a summary over uh, why it's important to have a will, powers of attorney, looking at how we're uh, executing wills. So in order for a will and power of attorney to be valid, there are certain formalities that have to be met, and these are set out in our uh, legislation in the Succession Law Reform Act. Um, a will must be in writing and subject to a few exceptions. Uh, for typed wills, there has to be two witnesses. So the testator, the person who's making the will, signs in the presence of two witnesses who also witness the document in the presence of each other and in the presence of the testator. And the two witnesses can't be beneficiaries of the will and they can't be spouses of beneficiaries. Then there's also um, what is known as a holograph will, which must be entirely in the own handwriting of the testator, the will maker. So there cannot be any type portion of this type of will. Um, and if a, if a will is made, if a holograph will is made, there is no witnesses um, required. For powers of attorney for property and personal care, 
the grantor, the person making the powers of attorney, um, must sign the document again in the presence of two witnesses. And there's also um, require, uh, specifications of who can't be a witness. So a witness, the witness cannot be an attorney. It can't be the person that's named under the power of attorney document. It can't be a spouse or partner of the attorney or a spouse or partner of the grantor. It can't be a child of the grantor or a person whom the grantor has demonstrated a settled intention to treat as their child. Um, it can't be a person who has, whose property is under guardianship or has a guardian of the person, and the witness has to be at least um, 18 years old. Now, with the physical distancing measure, measures that are in place as a result of COVID, these formalities have proven to be challenging and problematic. So thankfully, you know, we have some flexibility now. The government um, in April has had decided that we will be allowing, they will be allowing virtual witnessing for wills and powers of attorney. As long as one of the witnesses is a lawyer or a paralegal. And they've also allowed for signing in counterpart as long as everyone, so all three people will be signing complete identical copies of, of the documents. So, you know, we still have the same formalities in place but they're definitely more flexible now. And also this week, the government passed a bill to permit beneficiary designations on registered plans to be made electronically uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so in addition to this new way of signing that we have of the virtual witnessing by video conference, we still have the other options available to us. Um, there's, you know, we're, we're, we're being creative and enforcing the physical distancing measures and ensuring that if we are meeting with clients in person, everyone is wearing masks and gloves. We're taking the protective measures. People are doing this in their garages, in their backyards, on porches, um, just ensuring that the physical distancing measures are still kept in place so that everyone is comfortable. And there's always, of course, the option to postpone the signing appointment um, in person, but you know, unless the client insists on postponing, we wouldn't recommend something like this. And then, as I mentioned before, there's the option of holograph wills, which is just having the, the person who's making the will sign, write, write, handwrite, and sign their own will uh, where you don't need witnesses. But really, this is only for urgent and, you know, situations and situations that are quite straightforward because they don't really allow for proper planning and can create a lot of ambiguity um, in the drafting. In terms of when you should be reviewing your estate plan, typically we recommend that you review your wills and powers of attorney every three to five years, or more frequently if you've had a significant change in life circumstances. For example, if you've had a significant change in your net worth, you might wanna consider revising your will and maybe remove or decrease or increase legacies that you've provided for in your will. Uh, also, if an executor um, that you've appointed or a trustee or one of your beneficiaries um, of your will, or if an attorney for property that you've named or an attorney for personal care that you've named has passed away, you should, you should be updating the documents. Um, uh, similarly, if an executor or trustee or someone that you've named under a power of attorney for property or, for, for property or personal care has become incapable, you'll also want to update these documents. Um, if you have a new child or grandchild that you hadn't previously provided for in your will, then you would want to consider, you know, updating this to reflect the new, the new person in your family. Um, also, if your executor's residency status has changed, it may not make sense to appoint them anymore as your executor. For example, if your executor was living in Ontario and now they have moved to the U.S., from a practical perspective, it may be a problem. And also, um, now that U.S. person will have reporting and disclosure obligations to the IRS, um, for being an executor of a foreign estate. So, you know, it may not make sense to name them anymore. Uh, similarly, if a beneficiary's residency status has changed, 
uh, there might be tax consequences in the jurisdiction where your beneficiary has moved for receiving an inheritance. Uh, for example, if you have a child that has moved to the U.S., you might want to do some planning in your will because now that child might be subject to U.S. estate tax on their debt. So there's some planning that you can do in your will. Uh, if your own marital status has changed, if you're separated but you're not yet divorced, you'll want to update your documents because separation has no impact on your will or your beneficiary designations or who you've appointed under a power of attorney for property or personal care. Generally, if you're divorced, um, any gifts that you've made in your will to a former spouse will automatically be revoked. And the executor appointment, if you had named your former spouse, will also be revoked, as the will will be read as if the former spouse had predeceased you. But the same isn't true for your beneficiary designations and your powers of attorney. So divorce has no uh, impact on having named a former spouse as the beneficiary of a registered plan or a life insurance policy. Divorce also has no impact on naming, having named a former spouse as, a, as an attorney for property or personal care. And you, know, you probably, if you're divorced, you wouldn't want your former spouse making personal care decisions for you if you're incapable. Uh, also, if you're getting married, you'll want to, um, if you already have a will, make a new will um, because marriage in Ontario revokes uh, a will unless it's made in contemplation of, of your marriage. So if you have a will now and you are getting married, if you were to get married without changing your will, then and, and you pass away, you know, soon after your marriage, then it's as if you've died without a will, and then we fall into those intestacy rules, which I talked about earlier. So if you're if you have a wedding coming up, you're getting married, then you would want to go to your lawyer, tell them that you're getting married, and they will make sure that your will is updated to reflect that it's made in contemplation of your upcoming marriage. Lastly, if you set up a registered account or purchase a new life insurance policy after you've made your will, then you'll want to update your will because those new designations um, won't be provided for because the, the designations are only applicable as the date that you've made the designation in your will. So now I'm going to pass it back over to Marnie. Um, she's going to talk about estate administration tax and probate. Hi, thanks, thanks, Brittany. Um, so, so shifting a bit to a bit of a more technical planning um, focus for the little bit that's left in our presentation. Um, Probate planning. So oftentimes people call it probate. Um, from a technical perspective, it's um, estate administration tax, um, EAT, but, but generally we talk about probating a will, the act of probating a will. And effectively, um, Brittany at the beginning of our presentation talked about the income tax consequences of dying and estate administration tax is uh, the Ontario tax that, that, that is it's not a, it's a, effectively a death tax, but I, it's an optional tax in some ways um, if you do proper planning. So a state administration, um, ta a state administration tax is owing when your executor has to apply um, for a certificate of appointment of a state trustee with a will, or if you died intestate, a certificate of appointment of a state trustee without a will. And effectively what that, what that is, is it's when the executor takes a will and does a very simple over the counter application um, to the court and the court hands back a certificate that says yes this person passed away and this is the person in charge of the estate. Um, generally speaking you only need that piece of paper when a third party asks for it. Um, it's really it gives third parties comfort that they're handing over the portfolio to the right person that um, this person has in fact died and this is the person who's in charge. Now, as simple as it is to get that piece of paper from the court, it's expensive. Um, because with, uh, in order to get the piece of paper, you have to pay the tax. Um, and generally speaking, you're gonna need to get that piece of paper if you pass away owning 
a real estate in Ontario that is registered in your name alone, not a jointly held property. Um, land titles will not let you transfer it. Large bank accounts. Um, I've been asked the question, what is a large bank account? Uh, the general rule of thumb is you can probably negotiate to not need uh, probate if your account's under $50,000. Over $50,000, it's next to impossible. Um, and non-registered investment account. So generally speaking, if you pass away owning one of those types of assets with a financial institution in your own name, um, cert a certificate of appointment of a state trustee is going to, going to be required. Um, how is the tax calculated? Um, it's calculated based on the assets that fall under the will. And so I'm going to get into some planning that we do to minimize the tax. Um, but it's calculated based on the fair market value of the assets that you own in your own name um, on the date of death. Generally speaking, the only thing that you can deduct from that in terms of debts is an encumbrance on, on the real estate. So a registered mortgage. Income taxes, they don't care about. It, it's a fair market value calculation. And again, I'll emphasize that you only pay probate on the assets that are covered under the will that you're applying for. Um, anything that any registered accounts that do not have a designation or life insurance proceeds that do not have a direct designation to someone other than your estate. If the estate is named as the beneficiary, then probate fees will be payable. Um, generally speaking on those personal articles and effects. It can get expensive if, you know, because from a practical perspective, you actually have to value every single asset um, if you need probate. And, you know, kind of really anything else that's in your name alone. And again, I'm going to emphasize, and we're going to get into this conversation a bit later. If your will needs to be probated and you only have one will, as soon as one asset needs probate, you're going to have to pay and calculate the tax based on all of the assets that fall under that will. And that's a critical point because oftentimes if people have kind of structured their affairs to think they don't need probate through joint ownership or whatever they've done, if one asset puts them offside, all of the assets are offside. So that's a very important point when clients only have one will that I, that I just want to emphasize. Um, Again, assets that are not generally included, real estate outside of Ontario isn't subject to a state administration tax. The CPP death benefit is not. RESPs where a successor subscriber has been named and we do that in the will um, as a general statement. So it's important if you have a will that your advisor knows you have, have an RESP so that you can name the successor subscriber. Um, RRSPs, RIFs, TFSAs, Generally speaking, any registered account where you have named a specific beneficiary, that asset falls outside of the estate and is not subject to probate fees. Um, and here's kind of a key point, assets that fall into a properly drafted secondary will, including but not limited to shares in private corporations, assets registered held in name of a bear trustee, and personal articles and effects. And I'm going to stop on this point for a minute because it's critical. Um, this is what people call the corporate will, the private will, the secondary will. We use secondary will at our firm, so that's, that's kind of how I'm going to refer to it now. And if you recall what I said was that probate, the, the process of getting probate is only required if a third party asks for it. If a third party doesn't ask for it, you don't need to get it. So as a general statement, one will, as soon as one asset needs probate, they all need probate. But a very common planning technique in Ontario, um, particularly when people own shares of a private corporation, because that's just kind of the knee-jerk reaction, is to have two wills instead of one will. And effectively what we do in our drafting is we say, take all the assets that need probate and put them into my primary will. So my bank account, my Ontario real estate, put it into my primary will. And take all the assets where no one's gonna ask for probate and put them into my secondary will. And generally speaking, shares in a family business, your other shareholders aren't asking for probate. Your personal articles and effects, the ability to give your jewelry or your clothing or your watches to your children, no one's asking for probate. So we draft our wills. And the reason why I don't use the term corporate will is because our secondary wills incorporate so much more than just shares in private companies. It's a very detailed list of assets 
it effectively at the end of the day says, if no one's asking for probate, it's gonna go under this will. And if people are asking for probate, it's gonna go under this will. And so what we've done is we've hived off, hived off assets that need probate from the assets that don't and have thereby minimized the probate fees. So as an example, if you owned a house worth a million dollars, if you owned a cottage worth a million dollars, under, or sorry, not a cottage, and you own shares in a private company worth a million dollars, we've hived off the probate assets from the non-probate assets. Um, and assets that are owned jointly that pass by right of survivorship um, do not need probate. So Brad, if we could just skip the next slide because I kind of just talked about it <laughs> in this slide. Um, what is the fee? What is the tax? Why do I want to avoid it? Well, as a general statement, it's 15,000 per million. And remember that's fair market value. So it can quickly add up, particularly if you only have the one will and everything needs to be included. There is a requirement. You used to be able to kind of guesstimate the personal articles and effects, um, but there's now a requirement that you provide a very detailed list and get actual valuations to support the dollar figure. So if you're talking about an expensive jewelry collection or watches, or handbags or whatever it is, you're actually gonna have to ascribe a value to it and pay the corresponding estate administration tax. Um, so that kind of leads me to a very common form of probate planning that clients undertake on their own. Um, and that has to do with real estate. And it, it, I, I was just dealing with a client the other day who said, yeah, my dad put his condo in my name so that, you know, it was easy when he passed away. Um, but he lives in it and he pays all the expenses and, you know, it's really his and I have three other siblings who I'm supposed to share it with. So I'd like to just have a very quick conversation about uh, real estate and, and why you have to be very careful when you're trying to do probate planning because real estate is one of those assets that will put you offside. If you own a house in your own name, um, it will put you offside. Land titles will not, uh, except under very, very limited circumstances, pass without paying the probate fees. So in terms of real estate, there's two ways that people typically hold real estate. One is as a joint tenant. And what joint tenancy means is that there could be one, two, three, four of you on, on title. And as, as one person passes away, title just shifts to the remaining people. And effectively, the last person standing owns the property. Um, tenancy in common, however, is different. You, if you own a property is 50-50 tenants in common, when you pass away, your 50% interest passes under your will and you can transfer that interest to your beneficiaries. So it's two very distinct ways of, of owning property. Um, there are a lot of pitfalls um, of holding assets as, as um, and so often, sorry, what people will do is they'll say, okay, I'm just going to add my kid on, all is well, we're going to move on our merry way, and because they're on title as a joint tenant, when I pass away, probate isn't going to be required. Um, there are a lot of unintended consequences to that. One, and, and they're listed in pretty strong detail here, but you've effectively made a co-owner, potentially, if you don't document properly. Um, they've got a consent to sell or mortgage. They could force a sale to get an interest in the property. If it's not your principal residence and you truly add a child, um, take the cottage, for example, if it's not your principal residence and you add your child on, for tax purposes, there's been a disposition of 50% of the interest um, and you will have to pay capital gains tax on it. Any future gains will accrue to your child. Um, if it was your principal residence and you put your child on, you've, the, the whole of the property won't necessarily qualify for the principal residence exemption on a go-forward basis, or you've inadvertently disqualified them from claiming the principal residence exemption on their home. There's the potential for your child's creditors to claim against the property. Um, if your child starts using that property as a matrimonial home, um, there's the potential on a marriage dissolution or a breakdown for there to be a claim. Um, and the biggest one is that your kids might fight afterwards. You know, you added your child on for whatever reason, and then when you pass away, um, there's a fight. Now, as a general statement, when, when I find that when clients are adding their kids on, it is not to actually transfer title or an interest in the property, but it's really to protect it against probate. 
um, and it's really that the child is holding it as trustee for the parent. And so we do that planning, um, and that's the way to do it, but it's important to document your intention. So to do proper probate planning with children, and again, I caution against it, um, except in circ particular circumstances, where you transfer legal title and you add your child on as a joint tenant, but there is a piece of paper behind it that we call a declaration of trust, acknowledging that no, I don't own this property, this is mom's property, when mom passes away, this forms part of her estate. Um, and it belongs to her and it's gonna be divided equally between me and my siblings. If in conjunction with that declaration of trust, the parent has properly, executed, properly drafted primary secondary wills that includes assets held in trust as part of the secondary estate, then on the parent's death, the asset, the real estate will form part of the secondary estate and no probate fees will be payable. But again, it's very specific planning that needs to be done properly and documented properly. Um, and we're starting to run out of time, so I'm just gonna move on. And you can ask either Brittany or I questions about that whenever you want. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're just gonna finish up here. This is our last slide on charitable giving. So as we all know, all of our lives have been affected by the pandemic, but there are some who have had a more direct and consequential impact on their lives, such as frontline healthcare workers, families living in poverty, elderly people, people living with disabilities, and other vulnerable individuals, such as victims of abuse. Charities and not-for-profit organizations are under immense pressure as the demand for their services has significantly increased as a result of the virus. The reality is that most of these organizations wouldn't be able to operate if it weren't for private giving. There's many ways that you can help the COVID-19 effort, which I've listed here on the slide, such as supporting your favorite charities now, rather than waiting till the fall when most donations are made, or volunteering your time and services if you can't afford to give monetarily. If you're interested in being philanthropic, there are also ways to do so in a tax efficient manner. If you make donations while you're alive, you can claim the charitable donation tax credit up to a limit of 75% of your net income. There are some exceptions for which you can claim up to 100% of your net income, such as if you donate gifts of certified cultural property or ecologically sensitive land. Um, also in the year of death and the year preceding the year of death, you can claim up to 100% of your net income. There's an additional benefit if you donate publicly traded securities such as a Canadian bank, as you don't have to pay capital gains tax on any appreciated stock that you're donating. For example, if you own a stock that costs you $10 per share, and now the stock is worth $50 per share. If you donate the stock in kind to charity, meaning that you give the stock to the charity as is, the charity will receive the fair market value of $50 a share, and you would receive a, donate, a donation tax credit for the $50 per share, and the capital gains, which would otherwise be taxable to you, being $40 in this example, is exempt from tax. So this is more beneficial than selling the stock and donating cash to charity. You could also leave a charitable gift in your will or designate a charity as a beneficiary of a life insurance policy or um, as a beneficiary of a registered plan. Lastly, you can open a donor advised fund, which enables you to benefit from immediate tax savings for the full value of your donation. And at the same time, develop a charitable giving plan for dispersing funds to, to individual charities. It allows you to create a family legacy and support charities of your choice now and after you're gone. A donor advised fund is attractive as it eliminates the administrative burdens that come along with setting up a private foundation. And this is something that can be done with the Jewish Foundation. That concludes our presentation. Um, we're now going to open it up to questions, and I see we have received some questions in the chat. We'll just um, take a look at them now. So, Brittany, the first, the first question is, what does ambulatory mean? And so, 
So oh, I can sure. I can shift that to you because that was your slide. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that just that was just meant to be that the will um, is it speaks from the date of your death. So if you make a will today, but you you know you buy um, more assets or you acquire more assets or you lose assets, really the will takes effect on the date of your death. So it's whatever you own at the time of your death that um, the will would govern. Um, and so the next question, which was, um, it's, so is your real estate that's sold on death, if it's your principal residence, I'm assuming is the question, is it still taxed as a capital gain? Um, and the answer to that is no, a principal residence, if it is your principal residence is, is tax free and that, that is excluded from the deemed disposition on death. Um, so that, that, that is not included. And just to clarify, you can only have one principal yeah. residence per family unit. So, so and, and often, and, and a cottage can be a principal residence. So sometimes when people own two different um, properties on death, there's a mathematical calculation as to which property is going to claim, claim the exemption amount or claim the exemption. Right. Um, so in terms of life insurance, I have a strong opinion on this, so I'll start, and, and Brittany, you can, you can jump in. I'm, I do not think the insurance designation forms, the reason to do them is to avoid probate. Um, that's the primary reason to do it in the policy itself. I, I do not like seeing children named as alternate beneficiaries or contingent beneficiaries in the, in the designation forms themselves. And it circles back um, to what Brittany kind of said is, absent proper trust terms, you can't give the proceeds of an insurance policy to children outright, because generally it's more than $10,000. So if you name them as contingent beneficiaries, there, it begs the question, who's the trustee? What are the terms? When are the distributions? Because absent anything else, the law would say it's going to get paid into court. The office of the children's lawyer will administer the proceeds. And at 18, your child will receive their inheritance. So I'm a big proponent of doing the insurance designation in the will, in an insurance trust, um, or if people really don't want the added complication, paying the estate, the, the probate fees, and just getting it into the will and govern in accordance with the terms of the will. I agree with Marnie. I just, I'll add that even if you have um, children who are adult children and they have their own children, if you just fill out the form and put your children as the contingent beneficiaries, then if one of your child, one of your children predecease you and they left their own children, if your intention was for you know your grandchildren, that predeceased child's children to receive their share that they would have received, that won't happen if you don't set up um, this sort of insurance trust and you just fill it out on the form with the institution. So it, it doesn't allow for that flexibility. Otherwise, the, the whole of the proceeds will just be divided among the, re the remainder of your children that are alive. Um, agreed. Sorry, there's so many questions that have come in as we were asking, as we were answering these. So a corporate will, I think we discussed really, that's a probate savings. That's the only reason to have two wills. Um, is to minimize probate fees. And again, it's 15,000 per million. So it doesn't cost much to get the two wills in place, but there's a big upside and it's very common and respected planning. So I think that's important. Um, a Marnie, holograph I'm change, the last I don't question. Marnie, just last, yeah. last question. We're running out of time. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Oh, what's the last, the last question? Common law couples, I will just confirm you got to be married. Otherwise, um, you have dependent support claims. And that's really it. No property rights in a common law relationship. Thanks. And no, you can't each have a property. Common law spouses for income tax purposes are one. One family unit. Wow, ladies, that was incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm sorry to those of you whose questions we didn't get to. <laughs> Obviously, there was tremendous interest. We'll consider coming back with more information um, as things unfold and consider coming back due to all the, all the questions. But I'm sure 
we can't hear you, but I'm sure you're all clapping and thanking Marnie and Brittany as I am for their dedication, um, their concern for ensuring that everybody has a will. So if you don't have a will, time to run out and, uh, and ensure you make a will. And we really appreciate your time, Brittany, Marnie. Have a terrific day, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks.